In some fields, we have made great progress. Education, health, and housing, and the conservation of our resources that belong to all the people. In some respects, we've had uh, many disappointments. But in the last few years in this house, in this office, we have had a chance to impress upon the people of this nation those simple convictions that brought us to this town and that kept me here for almost uh, four decades. Today, there is more education available to our children from Head Start to adult education. There are more than a million additional students in college this year because of the higher education program enacted the last few years. Today, our young people and our old people too have better health care than they've ever had before. More than 20 million are served by Medicare and uh, their sons and daughters no longer have to fear for the medical treatment of their parents when they reach the twilight of their lives. In the field of housing, we have continued each year to increase the new starts in this land, and the housing bill passed this year will result in the ultimate expenditure of almost a trillion dollars for homes. And uh, to recognize that these things have actually come to pass, education, health, conservation, housing, gives us a great deal of satisfaction. But there are disappointments too. We're involved in a struggle in Southeast Asia where more than half a million of our men are tied down to protect our commitments, to preserve our integrity, to guarantee our security. We want peace so much, we're working at it diligently and earnestly, but it is an elusive thing and we have been unable to find the formula that would give us peace with honor in that area of the world and stop the killing. Although we will continue to search to the very last moment when we leave uh, this office. I think that's the biggest disappointment we've had. We're proud of the fact that uh, when President Kennedy was elected president in 1960 and I was on that ticket, that just a short time before Castroism threatened this hemisphere and had taken over Cuba 90 miles from our shores. Laos was a very disturbed and distressed area of the world. The developments in Africa, the Congo was aflame and threatened to spread to other African nations. The Berlin situation was extremely disturbing and at a very dangerous point that could easily bring on World War III. But through long and persistent and dedicated efforts of diplomats and military people, we have uh, avoided a crisis in Berlin we have uh, worked out uh, an arrangement that prevented Laos from being taken over by the communist leadership of Southeast Asia. We have protected the people of South Vietnam from communist rule. We have not yielded a foot of soil anywhere in the world to communist domination. They have suffered severe reverses in various parts of the world. Most people thought when we came into office in 1961 that it was just a matter of time until India and Pakistan would have grave problems with Chinese and that uh, under their systems they would be unable to uh, hold up and uh, stand up uh, 
to that situation. A great many people predicted that the Soviet economy would be dynamic and our own would get sluggish and just the reverse has happened. So as we look back on the last eight years and we see that the communists have not advanced in this hemisphere, they've lost great ground in Indonesia and Malaysia and other parts of Southeast Asia. They no longer uh, confront us with the ultimatums that uh, we had in Berlin and the extreme dangers. They have uh, made uh, threats and advances in the Middle East, but we have not succumbed to them. And we have uh, much to be thankful for in that respect, although we're quite disappointed that we do not have uh, peace in Vietnam itself. And we're disappointed that uh, we, while we move 7 million people above the poverty line, that there are still some 26 million people in this country whose families have an income of less than $3,000 per year. And there are still uh, many dropouts in school. There are still uh, many ghetto areas where the underprivileged don't have a fair chance. And we wish that we could have corrected all of that in the time allotted us. I guess I would say that we're pleased at what we've been able to do and sorry that we haven't been able to do more in the time we had. I remember a story uh, uh, that they told about uh, Prime Minister Churchill uh, toward the end of the World War II days when a little lady in her temperance group called upon him and said, Mr. Prime Minister, we want to protest your drinking habits. We are informed that if uh, all the brandy that you drunk during this war could be poured in this room, it would come up to fill half the room. And the Prime Minister looked at the floor and then he looked at the ceiling and uh, he glumly commented, my dear little lady, so little have I done. So much I have yet to do. And I guess I feel that way as I leave this office. Forty years of opportunity and so little uh, have I done. So much do I have yet to do. But we do know that we have taken steps that had to be taken. We've marched down a road that had to be marched. We have raised uh, the level of our attention in the fields that are most important to our future as a nation. Education of our people, the health of our citizens, the beauty of our land, and above all, peace in the world. And uh, in the days ahead, we must concentrate on how we can learn to live together with the other three billion people in the world without war. We must learn and help them learn how they can produce the food that the increased population will require in the years ahead. We must be challenged to face up to the population problem that confronts the world because we must not face a time when we have more people to feed than we have food to feed them. And I just wish that I could be coming back to Washington at the age that I came uh, almost 40 years ago. But I can't, and as I leave it, I will leave with the satisfaction of having done many of the things that I came here to do, but the disappointment that there's still much yet to do. We have so much to be thankful for. I just came back from the hospital where I saw Linda and her little girl. They are both cheerful and radiate great happiness. 
They're in good health. They have excellent care. The greatest treasure I have is my family. The greatest pleasure I get comes from them. And the, they're the pride of my life. And now to have a little girl join it, my thoughts went back to 24 years ago when I went to a hospital room and saw another beautiful lady with a little pink baby. And that was Linda's mother, and the baby was Linda. And it, uh, it made me realize how time uh, had passed. Of course, I wish that Captain Robb uh, could have been there to enjoy uh, the arrival of his firstborn as I was able to enjoy the arrival of my firstborn. But uh, he's away uh, protecting us all. And we were lucky enough to get him word of his birth of his baby in a matter of minutes. I remember when I was in New Guinea in World War II, I saw a young aviator who was uh, doing some of the work, uh, type of work that uh, Captain Robb's doing now, and asked him if I could do anything for him when I got back home, and he said, yes, find out whatever happened to my baby. It was due to be born about three weeks ago, and I've had no word. And the first thing I did when I got back to the States was to inquire about his baby. And although his wife had cabled him, and although she had written him several times, it was not easy to get messages through to New Guinea in those days. And she, he had never heard about his baby. So I asked General Marshall to send this message uh, through military means, which he did. And uh, in a matter of a few hours, I had confirmation that the young air captain had learned that he had a baby boy three weeks old. It just took a few minutes for Captain Robb to learn that last night. But uh, it was a great uh, event in our lives, as was the arrival of our first grandchild, uh, Patrick Linden. I took Patrick Linden out there with me this morning uh, to see his little cousin. He peered through the glass door as the little girl uh, cried in the arms of her nurse. And he had a very inquisitive look on his face and seemed to be asking himself this question, uh, what does this mean to me and do I have to divide now with you? Well, of course he does, but uh, we hope that that division uh, uh, will still leave enough love and care and uh, companionship uh, for both of them. And that's what Ms. Johnson and I want most after 40 years, a chance to uh, sleep with each other and live with our family and spend uh, our waking moments together instead of uh, with the night reading and with the files and with the crisis decisions. Uh, of course, uh, we'll always be available to do anything, any time that we can to serve this country that has given us so much. But we thought uh, last year, and we announced this year, that the time had come to uh, have someone else uh, look at these problems, try to ascertain uh, what challenges face them, and uh, what answers they could provide to those challenges, new answers, we have given ours. And uh, it's uh, important to, to reflect and look back and see what has been done because there's no better way to judge the future than by the past. But the important thing that faces our country now is for a new president to look at these new challenges and find new answers find a means of communicating with our young and providing leadership and inspiration for them so that they will realize that we do care. Find a way to uh, help uh, better understanding come to our races so that we can live together in peace and harmony and equality with justice to all. See how we can build an impregnable defense 
of our freedom without uh, endangering it by getting caught in uh, devastating a nuclear war. All these problems are just too big for any man. But the president must try to be tall enough to measure up to them. And I have no doubt but what in every crisis this nation's ever faced, we can produce the man that's equal to the crisis. We have the greatest system of government that human ingenuity has ever devised. And in the days ahead, we're going to protect and preserve that system so that we can not only continue to have happiness and prosperity and security here at home, but we love it so much that we want everybody in the world to have a little bit of it. And we want to be generous enough and Christian enough and understanding enough to see that happiness and that prosperity and that freedom, that liberty spread to every corner of this globe. And uh, if uh, we have been able to contribute anything to this end. Uh, our work of four decades will not have been in vain. The man who sits in this chair sits in the chair that's been occupied by less than 40 men in the long history of this great republic. He is selected uh, by the will and by the votes of a majority of the citizens of this republic. He must execute the philosophy and the policies of the people of this nation, regardless of his own personal feelings from time to time. He is the executor of the will of the people of this nation, and he carries upon his shoulders day and night a burden that always seems, at least to him, too much to carry, but only for him to carry. No president ever came to this office on a platform of doing what was wrong. Most of us have made some decisions that were wrong. And uh, as we leave office, uh, in a good many instances, most of the people uh, seem to feel that most of the things we've done have been wrong. But every man who's ever s occupied this office or sat at this desk or reclined in this chair has been dedicated to doing what he believed was for the best interest of the people of this country. I'm utterly convinced that when any man takes the oath of office as president, he is determined to do what is right as God gives him the wisdom to know the right. As I repeat, no man ever ran for president on a platform of doing what's wrong. And if he does what's wrong, it's just because he doesn't know any better. And if the president and the office and the institution usually have more information and more counsel and more knowledge on more of the problems of the country than any single office has or any single individual has. And if there's anything uh, to the old uh, saying that a man's judgment is no better than his information then 
president's judgments should be good because the people of the land have provided him with the best information that is obtainable. So most people come into the office with uh, great uh, dreams and they leave it uh, with many satisfactions and some disappointments and always some of their dreams uh, have not come true and uh, I'm no exception. But I'm so grateful and so proud that I've had my chance and as to how uh, successful we've been in doing the greatest good for the greatest number, the people themselves and their posterity must ultimately decide. I have the satisfaction, my family has the satisfaction that we gave it all we had. And we think we provided some of the answers to the needs of our time. This couch here at the end of what we call the West Hall is really the center of the family's living room. This is where the family is brought together when we can get together. This is where uh, I start the congressional briefings of the leadership when the Congress is in session. This is where we meet and assemble with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Secretary of State, and Secretary of Defense at the regular Tuesday luncheons. And uh, the, the men come and take their places at the chairs, and we sit here and review the agenda before we go into the dining room uh, for our lunch. This is where I come in the evening while I'm waiting to have dinner put on the table. And if there's any of the family that hadn't gone to bed, or even if they have gone to bed, they put on a robe and come here, and we spend some time together. I get great strength and comfort from my family. They give me a lot of happiness, and we enjoy being together, although we're not together very much. But when we are together, it's mostly here in the family living room. We have uh, direct lines to the principal assistants and departments that connected with this telephone. We have uh, the USIA programs that go all over the world that are available by mashing this button. Here's the schedule of the statements that go out over the Voice of America each day. Here's where we start our days and end our evenings. And when we have uh, state dinners uh, and the music is stopped and the folks are filing out, we usually collect here with a few of our very special friends to have a cup of coffee before uh, we call it uh, quits for the day. This is a spot that we'll always remember uh, with the most pleasant uh, recollections. I don't guess there's any job in the world that could truly be called a 24-hour job, but I expect the presidency comes near approaching a 24-hour job than any other one. Uh, that is that you spend a good many hours in your office, in the cabinet room, in the Rose Garden attending public events. But really I expect uh, most of the president's uh, day of the 24 hours in the day and night is spent really here in his bedroom. 
I awakened here every morning at 6.30 and immediately began to review the intelligence reports from the 130-odd countries in the world and the cables that have come in overnight and the reports from the commanders in the field on the, the engagements of our troops. And I look at the uh, losses that we've suffered and the uh, developments that have taken place uh, uh, during the night. The last thing I do before I go to sleep is to finish the night reading. I usually get here from the office about 11 in the evening and have a bite of dinner, and then I get in the bed and read for about two to three hours, sometimes till two, sometimes till three in the morning and I complete the night reading. The night reading is material that comes from the 12 cabinet offices, from the 50-odd independent agencies of government, from your correspondents uh, all over the world and in this country. And we have a provision made on each document that says approve or disapprove or call me. And I act on more than 100 of them almost every night. Some nights when I'm very tired, uh, uh, I just junk it all and let it go over to the next day. But I have to uh, give them my nap the next day if I do, so I can't get too far behind. About 8 o'clock in the morning, uh, my principal assistants uh, come here, and I have uh, read the intelligence reports, reviewed the morning papers, and then I go over with them the problems that they have, the requests that they need to have answered, the schedule they need to have approved for the day, the appointment list, and so on and so forth. And I rarely leave the bedroom before uh, 10 o'clock. So uh, the place where you are supposed to come to leave your cares and to rest your bones, your bedroom is really a workroom too for the president. I feel a great sentiment for these furnishings. I've lived with them uh, five years now. I'm looking forward, though, to the day when uh, I can close this door and go back uh, to my people, to my own home on the banks of the Perdinalis instead of the people's home here on the banks of the Potomac, when I can sleep in a bed uh, with my wife and have my grandchildren uh, play around on it instead of going to bed with my night reading and waking up with my intelligence reports.